This is Issue Forms for Open Source. My name is Luke Hefson. I'm a senior product manager at GitHub. This is me and my cat Uno. We have a somewhat adversarial relationship. I think that's pretty standard for humans and cats though. I've been at GitHub for nine years. And for the best part of those nine years, I've been obsessing over open source communities and uh, communities on GitHub, how they tick, how they work. Um, I'm really interested in helping to build those communities. Here you can see some tweets. This is a thing I like to do um, every now and again, reaching out into the, the wider GitHub open source community, asking questions, getting feedback. And I always find that I get just amazing engagement and interest. People are always really excited and stoked to talk about GitHub and, and the tools and what we can do to make GitHub better. And so I feel just, yeah, I feel really, um, uh, I'm really lucky for that, I think. And it's, I love talking to the community. I also want to help open source communities to self-organize. Um, by that, I mean, I wanna sort of find ways that we can help communities to scale but at the same time reduce maintainer fatigue and burnout, but more on that later. So as we're, I'm going to be talking about issue forms, I think it might be nice to go way back, provide some historical, historical context. So first, there were GitHub issues, I think introduced back in April 2009. Um, when GitHub issues were introduced, we, there was, uh, so GitHub issues are a sort of bug tracking software. They, the standard experience is this blank form that you fill out. You might land on it. So you're contributing to a repository and you get to this blank form and you have a bug or you, you've got a feature request and the, you can choose some labels. For the most part, it's, it's pretty simple. And that's actually the default experience even today, the blank issue uh, experience. And people love GitHub issues. They really love GitHub issues. They are the uh, most used sort of product uh, on GitHub. And, um, and over the years, we've, we've sort of scaled GitHub uh, issues along with our user base. Um, we have from 1 million to um, 5 million to 100 million and more repositories on GitHub. We started to realize that people were coming with us on that journey and open source projects love issues. They, I think they find, they enjoy the simplicity of GitHub issues. They enjoy that GitHub issues are next to the code and really transparent. Um, but sometimes the as we grew and as we scaled, we started realizing that you know, there were some problems here, right? Where uh, GitHub issues weren't working for some of these maintainers and some of these communities. We had a bit of a inflection point back in 2016 where a bunch of maintainers got together and they wrote this letter called uh, Dear GitHub, where they sort of went into some of the problems they're having scaling open source on GitHub, in particular using GitHub issues and some of the issues with the blank issues. And this was a really big deal. Um, it was wonderful that the community cared enough to tell us this and we took it really seriously. And it was uh, a big sort of time in the company and we had um, lots of people getting involved and, and reacting and, and figuring out ways forward. One of those, even, um, even Chris, Chris Rainstroff, our CEO at the time and founder of GitHub dusted off his laptop, uh, dusted off his laptop to spike out some code. That was the you see this pull request here. That's like an early idea for, for Markdown issue templates, which which then got eventually got implemented. And Markdown issue templates have helped thousands of teams ever since. But and um, I think oftentimes there's always a but. Um, there are issues with some issues with Markdown issue templates and ways that they don't scale for open source teams. They Markdown issue you can see in my uh, sort of demo GIF here. Markdown issue templates don't have required fields. So uh, here, you, you know, I'm sort of like acting as a user, and it's quite easy to sort of even though there's a section there that might be required, quite simple just to basically ignore that and just file an issue anyway. 
Uh, worse than that, markdown issue templates can actually be entirely ignored. I mean, the way they work is they sort of dump markdown placeholder text in the issue area and it's very simple just to remove that and get rid of it and then submit whatever you want, right? So why do these um, problems matter to open source communities so much? Well, um, in Nadia Eggball's fantastic book, Working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software, she describes uh, a tragedy of the commons where open source is uh, oftentimes created by people in their spare time, not necessarily their day job, when they have time, it's a passion, a passion of theirs, um, and that time is finite. And, but it's consumed by everybody, right? And, then, and so Nadia describes it very succinctly. She says that the scarcest resource in open source is maintainer's time. And this is something that I think we really need to be conscious of. So in this graph, which is not Nadia's, because that would be insulting, um, it would even be insulting to my children or my cat. Uh, this is all, unfortunately, my own work. Uh, but I use it as a basic point to illustrate how open source projects uh, are on a scale. They're not all the same. Every open source project is not cre created equally, and they each have different um, sort of paths and goals. I think that... Um, uh, they, and they grow in popularity over time. Sometimes that time might be quite short. A, a project might get popular really quickly. But either way, they sort of have different, different goals and, and operate at, at different scales, right? So smaller projects, they have different needs a lot of the time. Depending on their goals, they might want contributions. Uh, they might want a lot of contributions from anybody. They're trying to establish community, look for traction. For these teams, um, blank issues are great, right? They have a pretty low barrier to entry. You, it, they are very inviting. Just come, contribute, say what you have to say, get involved. And I think uh, some of these smaller projects, they really appreciate that and the simplicity of, of issues. But then at the other end of the scale, we have, some, we have the more popular uh, open source projects where they have the sort of opposite problem where because there's more eyes on the project there are more people going to that issues tab more people filing issues there's a higher chance of low quality contributions in fact some maintainers wouldn't consider some of their contributions as contributions per se um, they would even possibly think of some of these as more like support requests where somebody comes in they need help they open an issue and um, and it just creates, uh, uh, it can start to create some burden on the maintainers. They start to feel overwhelmed, they get burnt out, and that's, that's not good for anybody really. It's not, good for, it's not good for the maintainers, and it's not good for the entire open source um, community and ecosystem. We, we, and GitHub has a responsibility with the tools that we build and what we do and the platform that we provide to, to help with that. So, Again, not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping. My, my graph here is absolutely terrible. But um, this is just, again, illustrate a sort of basic point here that I think the more popular the, a project, an open source project may be, the more friction that they need for, for their public issues, right? Uh, and this is where issue forms come in. And when I say that, when I use the word friction, and friction doesn't have to equal a bad user experience for contributors, I think that it can be virtuous. So there's, this is an example where um, Homebrew are using issue forms uh, on, their, uh, on their bug um, bug template, basically. And it steps out in like pretty granular um, order of steps, you know, what they are looking for, like what you should do before you file an issue. Um, and they even use a checklist to ask that you verify that you've done certain steps, right? And so as a user of Homebrew, maybe I've, there's a, you know, having an issue with a package that comes to Homebrew, I see this and then I think, hang on a second, I, yeah, I, oh, I haven't actually updated the package. So they go do that, you have a light bulb moment, you're like, oh, okay, right, I'm good to go now. And so it's sort of win-win for both parties, I think, right, where the, uh, the user, the person that came to that, is now 
back up and running, they haven't had to file a ticket, but the maintainer themselves has not had to then devote any of that precious time to triage or, or sort of deal with this issue. So I think it's, yeah, I think a little bit of friction can be really great sometimes. So enough about the kind of problem space of issue forms. I'd love to dive into just a little bit of a demo to just kind of show you sort of what they are and how they work. Um, here I've got a um, GIF just showing you a issue form which is already committed to a repository and you can see there's a little preview there um, and then going into the edit mode. You'll also notice that it's similar to Markdown templates in that it lives within the issue template directory which is within the .github um, uh, uh, directory. And But most importantly, or very important thing to know, is that it's a YAML file, right? So you need that YAML extension. It's not a Markdown file like Markdown issue template. So just uh, make sure you have that YAML extension in. Right, and then this is the edit view. And in that edit view for a issue form, you've got this, um, I think it's pretty cool, this sort of like we embed the docs along the side. And because YAML um, is strict on spacing, right? You need to get that spacing right. I think those docs are super useful. What I do is I just tend to like grab the examples. We show some examples there and that like you can just copy that over and all the spacing will be right. And then you've got these different types that you can tweak and figure out how you want your form to be. And so here's a example of, um, of what a user would see, right? If they look, if they see a, a, an issue form or a repository, there's that um, in green there. I've placed the example, that's the, the, the input type that I've added. And there's, there's other types. Um, so you, basically an issue form is like a bunch of different um, types of form, right? That you can just reorder and place in there, uh, including text areas, these inputs, check boxes, drop downs with single type or multi-type. And you'll see that in the, that little red asterisk there, that's, that means that what I've done is I've made sure that this uh, specific uh, part of the form is required, right? So as a somebody coming in submitting, they wouldn't be able to actually finish submitting this form without uh, filling in that section, right? And I think that's really important. So why YAML? <laughs> okay, it's a good question in regards to the implementation of issue forms. I think there's two sort of um, parts to this, right? Number one, developers are already pretty familiar with YAML, certainly those that are going deeper into sort of process and, and what they need. Um, and so it makes sense for a lot of people. But also we had this, um, uh, we have this concept or maybe initiative at GitHub called Config as Code, where features or sort of um, capabilities that we, um, that are somewhat granular or like a little bit niche, like if we can do those as a config, we will try and bias towards that, right? And I think the reason for it is, I think it's pretty nice. It, it means that the overall UI complexity of GitHub like is reduced so that we can sort of holistically focus more on the core features of GitHub. And then, like I said, these things are a bit more niche. You can then go off and configure yourself. Um, another great thing about it is it adds, uh, again, this, using this phrase like good friction, like. Uh, there's a little bit of, with issue forms, I think if we provided a wizard or some sort of UI builder, I think it would be almost too easy to create lots of lots of forms. For, for everybody to go and just like start plastering all their issues with lots of um, form fields. And that can be somewhat intimidating, I think. So I think once you feel the need that you're going to like want to stop bringing in issue forms, then you can invest to basically do do the config and, and, and add it. But we don't necessarily want tons of people adding those all the time, right? And then another thing I love about it is it just, it is having those as a config on your repository, like publicly accessible to everybody. It's just very transparent, right? And it's in the spirit of community. You know, we're, it's a sort of declaration of like, here's, you know, here are the, the this is what the form looks like. If you wanna propose a change, open a PR. I think it's really nice like that. And that sort of brings me on to, you know, sort of that idea of like building with the community. I think that's also a nice segue into how issue forms are built. So issue forms, 
Um, we started with the most minimal viable product we could. And as soon as we had that, we found people in the wide open source community that were struggling with, with scale and with these issues. And, and we onboarded them onto it, right? And we created a private alpha with a private repository in, in which we enabled discussions, which is amazing. I love discussions, they're great. And use that as a forum to create this sort of tight feedback loop where people that were in the alpha could then sort of like, we could, you know, sort of tell us what problems they're having. We can discuss those with them. We can riff on solutions. We could then go back and implement things pretty quickly and then go back, take it back very quickly to the community and talk about those things and how they can be improved. And yeah, it's just this really wonderful cycle really quickly of, of getting things done and, and building with the community. Something um, I really like, um, this, uh, this, this graph, is, I just love it so much. You can see um, how those sort of, how that iteration, how those iteration cycles and that tempo really works. There's, so this, this chart is the number of issue forms created um, from the beginning, from that MVP right up until we went a public beta with issue forms. And uh, so that's that green box there. That's when we went to the public beta. But ignoring that part, like what I really like is that that really gradual build up from the beginning up until that point. And I think that really iterates how it, we weren't even adding a lot of new people to the alpha. It would, that's just the, a lot of the same people getting more and more value out of the product and, and, and talking to us and us figuring out together how to make it better um, until we reached the point in which it went public beta. And that's where we are now, right? I'm really excited. I think there's still lots of things we can do, but working with the community in that way helped us figure out like what level of quality did we need to get to to get to the public beta and and then once we're into public beta, we can then start taking on a lot more feedback. And that's where we are. That's where we are now. So please go out there, try out issue forms, check out the docs and look at other repositories and how they've done it and big open source projects like some great examples of Next.js or Electron or Homebrew. You can go look at those. You could fork them. You can tweak them. And yeah, try them out. Let us know how you feel about them. Give, give us feedback. There's, you can go to the GitHub feedback repo and, and tell us how you get on. So I'm really excited to hear um, about all the things that you build and what you do and find out what's next for, for issue forms. I hope you really like them. So thanks for listening to me today. I really appreciate it. Cheers.